it's good to be home you know, after the uh, frankly insane events of the past month or so. It's nothing like settling back in a comfortable life, a small town newspaper reporter. Except, of course, that small town is Habitsville. We're prone to the strange here, you know, no fault of our own. Bizarre things just seem to happen, and just like clockwork, they're happening again. It came to me by word of mouth, but as far as I can tell, it started with a sign. I walked by the bakery myself just to be sure. And there it was, hanging in the window. It was small, white, and plain, but the words on it stood out in an unnatural way. I should have missed the phrase when I was walking by, but instead found that it commanded my absolute attention. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. An odd sort of laugh rose in my throat when I actually saw it, because up until that post, I thought Heather had lost her mind. Heather is my primary co-worker at Habitsville Gazette. We're good friends. We often talk about everything from our pieces from the paper to what shows we're binging on Netflix. I know her pretty well, which is why it was strange when she suddenly said something extremely out of character, mid-conversation. She had been talking about her parents coming to visit from a few towns over, and how cautious they always were when it came to Habitsville, as visitors often are. We were packing up our things for the day before we went home when she said, My parents should be here Thursday, which is way too soon. The apartment's a mess, and it's too small to fit all of us anyway. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. But how do you tell your parents they should get a hotel outside of town? I asked her what she meant. But as you might be able to guess, she had no idea what I was talking about. I even repeated the phrase back to her. Not a hint of recognition appeared in her eyes. I went home, and after a while, I forgot about it. But then, then I heard it again. Stepping outside of my house for work the following morning, I spotted my mailman, Phil, putting a few envelopes into my mailbox. I waved to him and said good morning. And like any polite person, he answered, Good morning! Butternut Bakery doesn't serve human flesh! He held his smile as though he hadn't said anything strange. And cheerfully moved on to my neighbor's mailbox. I, however... I was deeply confused. It felt like some sort of prank, but I had no idea who would orchestrate it and why. I heard it again later that day. In fact, I heard it 17 more times. Some people repeated it, some only said it once. I don't have a transcript from an interview I was supposed to be doing with an old woman who just turned 102. Where there, right in the middle of her sentence about her great-grandkids, was the phrase, The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I hadn't heard it when she said it, but it was there. Typed out in my notes. So there I was. Clocking out early on a Tuesday afternoon just so I could stand in front of this bakery. I was bewildered, but not just because the phrase, though that was a bizarre one on its own. See, I lived in Habitsville my entire life. And not once have I ever heard of a place called Butternut Bakery. And yet, an afternoon spent wandering the streets of my own hometown, I found a new shop right there in the middle of the main strip. It's a small building, but not so small that I would miss it. The building itself had an inviting burnt orange color, and the yellow lights inside made the entire place look warm and enticing. The smell of baked goods drifted out and over the pavement to where I stood on the other side of the street, fighting the overwhelming urge to go inside. Because there was the sign, wasn't there? The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. It seemed like such an odd thing for Bakery to have to clarify. Maybe it was some sort of fun reference to Sweeney Todd? But that doesn't, that's not exactly an appealing allusion to make to potential customers. But there was something about the sign, something about the phrase. It was like, the more that I heard or read it, the less odd it seemed. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. Of course it doesn't. No bakeries do, or should. It's just good advertising to make the fact clear. I didn't see anyone walk in or out of the bakery for around 15 minutes, though plenty of people walked down the sidewalk. I mean, it was strange. Even the window shoppers that were strolling from display to display didn't bother to stop at the bakery. 
It was the late afternoon when someone might want to grab a snack or a late lunch, but no one gave it a second look. They didn't even seem to notice the smell, which was becoming more distracting by the second. My stomach began to growl as I caught another nostril full. And then, I saw someone emerge from the bakery. I had to squint, and it was hard to recognize him outside of his uniform, but I could still tell it was Phil, my mailman. He stepped out of the bakery holding a small bag and immediately began to walk down the sidewalk. I crossed the street and approached, walking behind him. Phil! I called out in a friendly manner. Oddly, he didn't respond. I thought perhaps he didn't hear me, so I walked faster until I was beside him. Phil. At the second call of his name, Phil stopped and turned to look at me. He smiled when he recognized me. Oh, Mr. Singer! Funny running into you here! It was tone to suggest that he were having a normal run-in on the street. It was anything of the sort. There were markings drawn on his face as though he was about to have some sort of cosmetic surgery. There were long strips drawn around his cheeks. I could see some ink was peeking out from the circles that marked his ears. But as it turned out, that wasn't the oddest part of Phil's appearance. I had thought it was his bag that had been dripping, something dark that trailed from the door of the bakery to where he stood now, but since we had stilled, the trickle only came faster and began to pool in a puddle around our feet. It wasn't hard to miss the source. Framed by the frayed edges of the shirt he wore, I could see that there was a large chunk of flesh missing from Phil's shoulder. Not like he had a bad wound that needed to be sewn up. There was... There was nothing to sew. It was a scoop out of his body, and I could see the tip of his shoulder bones poking out where they connected at the socket. I didn't know what to say. There was no trace of pain on his face. There was no signal that he even knew what he was walking around with, and oddly enough, no one on the street seemed to notice either. I had a brief rush of fear as I considered that perhaps I had lost my own sanity, and then... And then he said it. I just picked up a treat for myself. The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I've just finished my route for the day. He unraveled the folded up opening to his bag and held it out to me. Would you like to try? I tore my eyes away from the gory wound on his torso and instead peered into his bag. On the bottom, as as innocent as it could be, was a medium-sized pastry. It was a pocket style, crimped around the edges, no doubt with some sort of filling inside. My stomach was turning violently now, and I just shook my head at Phil. Suit yourself. It's the second time I've been this week. It's terrible for my diet, but it's just so good, he said with a chuckle. The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I'll see you tomorrow morning, then. With that, he turned and continued down the pavement, walking with a limp I'd never known him to have before. I walked to the front of the bakery, despite the warm glow coming from inside. The windows were not well suited for display. The glass had some sort of coating on it, and although I could see the light shining through and dark shapes moving around inside, I couldn't make anything out. I was so focused on seeing inside that I didn't notice when someone had opened the door. The small bell at the top jingled, and and I looked up. It was Heather. I lurched forward, grabbing her by the hand. She flinched in shock, and then half laughed. Sam, God, you scared me. The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. Are you going inside? She motioned into the open doorway, and I looked inside. It's difficult to describe what I saw inside the butternut bakery, mostly because the inside scene with the naked eye was strangely similar to the view through the glass. There was this hazy film over everything. The only two certain sights could be gleaned. The bright yellow light and dark shadows moving around in the back. You shouldn't go in there, Heather, I said, thinking of Phil's monstrous wound. I know this sounds crazy, I know. I I took a deep breath and said, but I think the butternut bakery is serving human flesh. Or at least that's what I meant to say. 
I could hear the words as they came from my lips, though they were not the ones I had chosen at all. I said, But I think the butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I stood there, horrified. Heather furrowed her brow at me. One foot stood on the doorstep of the building. Yes, yeah, Sam, I know. You told me before, the butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I think it's great. I blinked. I... I told you before? The fear that was rising within me was quickly turning to panic. I thought Heather had been the first one to say the phrase to me only a few days before, and never did I think I had said it back to her. What? When you mentioned it a few days ago? Her frown deepened. You've been talking about the bakery for over a month, Sam. I have? I mean, it's not much of a discussion. You pretty much just say the same thing every time. She leans back out of the door and pointed to that sign that hung in the window. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. As I stood there, spiraling, I had to look down at my hand, which it still clasped firmly on her wrist. Now, if you'll excuse me, you're being weird. And I'm hungry. This shook me from my days. I couldn't let what had happened to Phil happen to Heather. I pulled hard on her wrist, and she took another step forward into the interior of the building. I tried to warn her, tried to say, I just saw my mailman come out of there with a huge piece of his body missing. Just missing, Heather. You, you can't go in there. I don't know what's going on, but it's dangerous. That's what I tried to say. But deep down, I knew what was going to come out. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. 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 I pulled Heather even harder, and she fought back with as much force as she could. The shadows in the back of the bakery were moving faster now, even buzzing around the edges. Each were vibrating violently with some unseen energy. The yellow glow of the lights burned brighter, so bright I had to squint. I thought of the blood trail I had seen dripping from Phil's shoulder, the exposed bone and ligaments peeking through the mangled skin, the, the butcher lines drawn on his face, and I I pulled with all my might. Heather lost her footing. We fell backwards, one on top of the other, hard on the pavement. The door she had pulled open slammed, as though sucked by a vacuum, and when it did, the bell at the top jingled violently, and the entire building jumped with the force of the closure. It was that flinch, that slammed door, that made the sign fall from the window. I saw the words. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. One last time in plain black text on a white background. Then I blinked. And it was gone. Not just the fallen sign. No, the, the entire... The entire building was gone. People were walking by us now as though they hadn't seen what had happened. Instead, they only gave us odd looks and stepped over our bodies. I sat up. I looked around. The main street of Habitsville is just as I had always known it. Before I had heard of that place. The one that... I don't dare speak again. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast, if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I also want to tell you guys, if you look in the description, there's a lot of really cool things that you can always see down there, including uh, links over to two Creepypasta books that I curated that are available now on Amazon. Check those out, the Creepypasta Collection Volume 1 and Volume 2. Great for people that like horror, or creepypastas, or people who listen to this podcast. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakin, Ken Lendo Higuchi, Chambinski, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, 
Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>